Hi, my name is Wendy Lee Smachek. I am the Arts and Humanities Librarian at Central Washington University. Um, today, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about digital humanities with you. Um, kind of giving you a basic rundown of what are the digital humanities, um, some examples of technology that's used in the digital humanities, a little bit about the history, um, and uh, kind of the, the uh, resources and um, information about digital humanities at uh, Central Washington University and how you might apply some of the, the technologies that we have and the concepts of digital humanities to your projects and scholarship. So first, what are the digital humanities? The digital humanities is a loosely defined field that encompasses the application of various computer-based tools and methods to traditional humanities disciplines. Wikipedia offers another, um, another definition that I think is useful, which is about the, uh, that, di that digital humanities is the um, intersection of computing or digital technologies with the discipline of the humanities. So scholarship, scholarly activity, um, that's at that intersection. A little history about the digital humanities. Um, it was descended from the field of humanities computing, which started in the 40s and 50s. This began with text encoding projects um, that sorted, counted, and uh, facilitated word search of large corpuses of text. One of the first projects um, known as humanities computing was of Thomas Aquinas's writings. Um, that was by Robert Busa at IBM. Uh, this is an example of one of the punch cards from the Aquinas project um, back when computers were you know, filling up entire rooms and the, um, the way that you communicated with the computer was via this kind of punch card. The first digital humanities journal, Computers and the Humanities, was established in 1966. Um, shortly after, in the early 80s, the text encoding initiatives standardized text encoding practices and tags, um, which made it a lot easier for um, people to facilitate and participate in these kinds of um, projects. Many projects um, early on in the humanities were in the English discipline. Um, for example, the William Blake Archive in 1994. There was a change from the humanities computing um, label to digital humanities, which was attributed to John Unsworth, and that happened in 2004. And in 2006, the National Endowment of the Humanities launched the Digital Humanities Initiative, which, fund, which funded and has continued to fund numerous digital humanities projects up until the present day. Um, and you know, nowadays, digital humanities centers exist at all major universities. Um, there are conferences about digital humanities, um, journals, and a large number of projects and scholarship. Um, many people feel uh, kind of intimidated by the digital humanities, think, you know, oh, I don't really know anything about technology, so um, I can't participate in this. I need uh, some kind of special skill set. Um, and while there are those projects that use really advanced skills, and I'll talk about some of those, um, there are, you know, very uh, simple ways that you can incorporate some aspect of technology or um, digital softwares and um, into your, uh, your scholarship and make a contribution to digital humanities scholarship. Here are some examples of technologies that can be used. Um, text encoding, which I already mentioned, and that is using a markup language like XML to um, add tags to a, a piece of text, which then you can use those tags to bring together, um, you know, information about those texts, like uh, the instance of a particular word, for example, and you can use um, visualization softwares to uh, represent, you know, how often is this word used? What's the correlation between this word and another? Um, I'll show you an example of that uh, software called Buoyance in a little bit. Um, you can also uh, use just like digitization, um, um, digitizing images of primary sources, um, scans of original documents like letters, journals, poems, um, and then you can present them on a, on, a, on a website. That's a digital humanities project. You can also get really fancy and use machine learning and artificial intelligence um, and geographic information systems, also known as GIS data, um, to, you know, for example, 
um, recreate uh, ancient map sites. So you can take a, a, um, a site from a map and create a, a 3D model of it um, and combine it with uh, GIS data, like um, this project Book of Fortresses, which I'll also show you in a little bit. Um, you can use virtual reality uh, to um, have people walk through these sites. Um, you can use visualization software and tools to represent uh, different data, like the text encoding data. You can incorporate video or audio into your project. Um, so for example, you could have uh, an individual read letters um, from your primary source, um, you know, your primary source uh, ex exhibit and include those audio recordings uh, alongside the image and the text. So creating a, like a more rich experience for, for the, the viewer. Again, yes, the digital humanities today, we might just call the humanities because the digital aspect is so um, ubiquitous and so common in, in scholarship today that we may just, you know, eventually I could see the digital sort of dropping away from it because, you know, it's just kind of how we do the humanities now. Um, so don't feel intimidated. You don't need any special skill set to make a contribution. If you can, you know, if you can tag, if you can use Google Maps, you can make a geospatial um, representation of a literary work. You can do that like James Baldwin's Paris, which I'll show you. So um, I think inter interdisciplinarity is a big feature of digital humanities and alongside that collaboration. So if you don't have the skill necessarily of coding or artificial intelligence or virtual reality or even web design, you can find um, a co-conspirator for your project. And um, you know that collaboration is gonna make more success anyway, right? Because we don't all have the, the time and the capacity to do things um, all on our own. So we're better together. Um, the digital humanities are a great place um, to begin, you know, collaborating with someone outside of your field. Next, I want to just share a few examples of digital humanities projects with you all. Um, I've, I've selected a few that kind of incorporate different technologies um, and different levels of complication, um, and mostly from the field of English, but I've also got one um, that's a collaboration between um, uh, Africana and Black Studies and a, uh, I think, an anthropology class, um, which is the Thousand Cap Journey. Um, and most of the other ones are literary. This one, Book of Fortresses, is um, an art history project. So I'm just going to click on the first one, the Emily Dickinson Lexicon. Open that up. Um, this is the website. It's fairly... Um, uncomplicated. This was started in 2007 at Brigham Young University. And what it does is it takes um, the actual uh, Webster's dictionary that Emily Dickinson kept on her desk and it um, digitizes that and then it um, provides uh, a set of her poems that um, like when you click on the, the, the word in her poem, that it links it to the, um, the actual Webster's Dictionary definition that she was using. So it helps us to understand the context of the way that she was using language as she would have understood it in her context um, instead of our, you know, our context, which is a modern context. Um, so you can, you can read her lexicon, you can click on words um, and you can, uh, see what they mean, um, and you can just explore it. So this is useful for scholars who are um, studying Emily Dickinson and trying to do close reading and textual uh, criticism of her work. Baldwin's Paris is a very simple geospatial um, project that it takes references from James Baldwin's um, novel, uh, thinking on the name of the novel right now, but um, takes, takes um, examples from, uh, you know, his writing in his novels and his writing and takes like buildings and monuments, restaurants and cafes, different locations around Paris that he mentions in his writing and it makes a map of them. 
So this is really simple. This is something most people can do is put a pin on Google. Um, and so you can click around on here, see different points um, of Paris that um, were important to Baldwin. And then it has um, the, you know, what, what is the text and what is the page number and the quote that references that place. Um, so that's James Baldwin's Paris. The Book of Fortresses, like I said, this is an art, art history project. Um, it's a digital art history project that spatially reconstructs early 16th century Portuguese um, sources um, of this same name. And so this uses um, 3D modeling and um, GIS data. So you can click on Palindrol. It will give me this um, rendering, um, this primary source rendering of, of this place. And then it gives me some uh, metadata, some information about the, um, the object and the place. This one's not working. I'm going to go back. So we've got this nice digitized drawing of this place. It's a map. And then we can go to the 3D model. There we go. 3D model. Like it's loading. Okay. So here's the 3D model. We can look all around it. Um, can zoom in and out. Whoa. Where am I? Where am I? So anyway, you get the idea. You can kind of explore um, this 3D model of this drawing, which is taking taking this into a really different. Um, place a very different like spatial understanding of this and really enriching our experience of um, looking at this um, looking at this piece of art history. <clears throat> Thousand Cut Journey is an augmented reality um, experience, a virtual reality experience um, that was created to kind of help people understand what it's like to experience um, racism. So it is a, uh, a way that a participant can um, part can uh, embody an avatar and walk through um, a series of events that um, mimic sort of what um, people experience when they experience racism. Um, and yeah, it's a really interesting um, application of the technology. And you can actually, if you have virtual reality headset, you can download it, download the program and try it yourself. And then lastly, the Walt Whitman Archive, pretty similar to the Emily Dickinson lexicon in that it's a very straightforward, simple website. But what this website does is it brings together um, different pieces of Walt Whitman um, works, his notebooks, his images, letters, audio, um, and brings them together from disparate places on the internet into this single um, you know, archive. So it'll have links that go out to different um, libraries and special collections that have pieces of Whitman um, stuff. Um, and it, so this is bringing them all together um, in, into a single place so that they're ex accessible and easily navigable by um, scholars or people who are interested in learning about Walt Whitman, the poet. And then, oh gosh, lastly from Central Washington, we have our own uh, digital humanities project from the English department. It's called Cascadia Chronicle. Um, it's been a little bit uh, out of commission during the pandemic, but um, there is a plan to revive it. Uh, it is a, um, a virtual, you know, a digital literary magazine that um, is about uh, Cascadia, um, which is the you know, general area around here. Um, and it incorporates uh, geospatial um, technologies um, in, in, and geospatial poetry, they call it, uh, and includes images and audio as well. 
So as I said, the digital humanities at Central Washington um, are, are kind of budding. Um, we have the Cascadia Chronicle with many contributions by the English department. There are some faculty on campus who have research interests that include DH um, in scholar works. We are working on digital exhibits from the archives and special collections. Um, scholar works also has a lot of multimedia content, things that could be considered digital humanities projects can be found there. Um, and also we have a new digital humanities lab here at the libraries. The digital, the digital humanities lab is located on the third floor of the library near the microfilms. It includes two first come first serve computers um, with special software for working in the digital humanities like Tableau, Statista, Constellate, um, also known as Jupyter Notebooks, Notepad++, and a, a program called Orange Data Mining. We also have a, a libguide or a research guide that um, helps to uh, provide some context and some help resources for using the Digital Humanities Lab. Um, so when you click on that, you'll find information about each of the programs um, and there'll be some help resources about how to use them as well. Um, some of the, just a little information about each of the uh, softwares. Tableau is an intuitive data visualization software. Um, Statista is a statistical data resource that includes market reports and charts that can be used in papers and, and proposals and projects. Um, Constellate and Jupyter Notebooks is a text and data mining platform from JSTOR, and I'll give a little demo of that. Notepad++ is an open source code editor, um, so that would be used for text encoding, um, text analysis. Um, you can do that yourself, you can learn to do that yourself or you can use something like um, Voyant, which I'll show you, which is a, a free software um, to upload your text and, and use, their, um, use their tools to, to analyze your text that you upload. Um, eventually, it will also be possible to upload your own text on Constellate and Jupyter Notebooks. And then Orange Data Mining is a visual programming software package for vis visual visualizing and analyzing different kinds of data. Okay, let's, let's run through a couple of demos. I wanted to show you how to use Constellate. Give a little sample of how that works. Just get my link. Okay, so this is Constellate. Um, and I'm just gonna throw in my search term tomboy. And it's going to pull a data set for me of everything that's in JSTOR that has the keyword tomboy in it from 1900 to current day. I'm going to click on this build button and it's going to pull together my data set. Usually this takes a little while, but I've already done this. So it's here um, ready for me. It's got 13,000 documents in it. Uh, I'm going to click on analyze. Um, these are some different uh things that i can do um in my uh with my with my data and so i'm setting up metadata and pre-processing so that's a notebook that's going to show me uh, metadata and the date of the data set i'm going to click on word frequencies get that set up <sighs> Also click visualize and just get some quick um, visualizations about uh, this search term and the documents that I've pulled together. About word frequency, about document categories over time. So what subject are these documents in? Where is this word appearing? Um, I can see, you know, just all the documents in my data set. So lastly, I just want to share Voyant, um, which is a free web-based um, reading and analysis environment for digital texts. Um, and so I'm just going to pull some text from, you know, chapter three of Moby Dick, which is available on Project Gutenberg, which is a huge open source um, a repository of, of texts that are in the public. 
domain. So I'm just gonna grab like the whole chapter, chapter three, and I'm gonna paste it into the text box and click review. And this is going to analyze um, the text that I have added, and it's gonna show me about word frequency. Um, and uh, it can also show me correlations between words. So words that um, occur together um, and how often, um, how often individual words appear. I can like filter out by a word. So here's the word harpooner and how often it, um, it occurs. Like it creates this word cloud for me. So again, this is uh, useful for textual analysis. Um, So that's something you can use from home. You don't need to be in the DH lab for that. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just go back to my slideshow. A couple of debates in the digital humanities. Um, accessibility is a, is a big question. Um, accessibility of these kinds of projects for people with disabilities. Um, some, of, some of these technologies can make things more accessible for people with disabilities. Some of them can make things less accessible. So um, considering that, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the digital humanities, whose digital humanities um, projects are getting funding, getting attention, um, who are the digital humanities projects about? Um, as a question, uh, there's a lot of conversation about open access and copyright and how that works with digital humanities projects. And um, there's an ongoing debate about digital humanities pedagogy and um, how to use, uh, you know, different technologies um, with teaching. Um, I've got some further reading here. I'll post the, um, we'll, we'll like connect the video and this um, slideshow so that you can click on them. Um, Duke Libraries has a really great research guide about digital humanities and has a little intro about text analysis that's useful. Um, there's a link to different texts and books um, on the digital humanities we have at Central Washington University Libraries. Um, there's a, I, I linked to Tableau's um, description of what data visualization is and uh, the National Endowment of the Humanities Office for Digital Humanities. If you have any questions, please feel to contact myself or my colleague Maurice Blackson um, about incorporating the digital humanities into your project or your research. And we will do our best to connect you with the resources that you need. Um, you can also contact our 24-7 chat. Um, if a librarian on duty can't help you, um, they will find the right person to help you. Uh, thank you for watching. Again, my name is Wendy Spachek. I'm the Arts and Humanities Librarian here at Central Washington University. Um, good luck, happy researching, and take care.